my name is Victor Jernigan, and I normally am dealing in subjects exclusively about real estate, but I do find it important that there be some perspective on what's going on with the coronavirus today. In a phone call I had with an investor early last week, they asked me, since I was old, how did I respond to these different events that had happened in the past? And I made the comment that I had been alive during the uh, Asian flu pandemic, the oil crisis, the uh, and all of the other related uh, events that have occurred over the last 60 years. But as I got off the phone, I began to think back to how did America deal? How did this country survive the Asian flu pandemic in from 57, 58, when we know 70,000 people died because of the flu, because of the Asian flu. And so as I began to do the research, I decided to put together this little PowerPoint presentation. It's about 20 minutes long. I do hope you enjoy it because it does help us understand the difference between the way we live today and the way we lived 60 years ago. So the, uh, the Asian flu pandemic was uh, started the fall of 57 and went through the spring of 58. And back then the U.S. population was 178 million people. The estimate of the number of people infected by the flu ranges from about 45 million people to about 80 million. And the additional deaths due to the Asian flu, and it's important, the additional deaths, not what was normally anticipated, but the additional deaths due to the Asian flu, between 65 and 70,000 people. And the percentage of deaths confirmed that there's a scientific term for it, confirmation of death uh, for the infection, but it was 0.15%. So what happened was, and this is where we need to all be paying attention, because what happened was there was a, a Dr. Hilleman, and Dr. Hilleman was a genius, and he was reading an article in April and 1957, and he read about a um, virus that had uh, infected more than a quarter million people in Hong Kong in less than 45 days. Now, I began this search by just doing a simple Google search. I'd never heard of this doctor before, but I was doing just a simple Google search of uh, flu pandemics. And since 1957 was the most deadly since 1918, uh, one of the searches that came up was history.com, the story of Dr. Hilleman. And he was the chief of respiratory diseases at the Walter Reed Army Hospital. And he really was decades ahead of his time in being able to grasp the speed with which these kinds of diseases moved. And since he had the, uh, the availability of uh, being able to reach out to the Navy in, that was in Japan, get some specimens of sailors who had, contract, who had contracted the flu, and had, while they had been in Hong Kong or in the East, in the Far East, he began to do the research, and he uh, predicted that the flu would reach the United States in September, maybe sooner, but in September for sure. And he began to gather scientists all over the country. Uh, but when uh, he did, began to reach out to those scientists, he ran into all kinds of problems. And he decided, the, with government regulation, if you can imagine, and he decided to bypass the regulatory agencies so that he could push the vaccine forward because he was worried that if we didn't get something in place, millions of people could die. Now, on a separate note, if you haven't seen the movie Contagion, I don't want this to be a spoiler, but I do believe the character that Elliot Gould plays in that movie is based on Dr. Hilleman. So, when that flu, the Asian flu, hit the United States, just as Dr. Hilleman had predicted, the country did have a vaccine. The vaccine uh, was, uh, the, the flu was dubbed the Asian flu. It killed about 70,000 people, as I've said before, but one to four million people worldwide died. And the reason there were so many fewer deaths in America, according to this article, in history.com 
was that America had a vaccine to protect it. But I thought, well, you know, if, if there were 70,000 people dying and all these people were sick, 40 million people, it must have just absolutely inundated the hospitals. I mean, I, I see what's going on in the news today, and uh, every hospital is trying to get, get more bed space, and everybody's talking about getting ventilators. What would it have been like to live in the United States in 1957? So I, something that everybody could do while we're at home, uh, while which I do frequently, I have a library card and I get online and I'm, I'm doing research for real estate projects where I'm looking back at history. I'm looking for information about some particular person or some particular piece of property. But if you go online, uh, the newspaper archives are there in every city in America, you can do this. And I suggest this would be a good exercise for everyone to see how your city responded in September, 1957 to the worst pandemic since the great Spanish flu of 1918. And so when I go online, here are the available issues of the newspaper. And when I'm doing this, the uh, paper is, I picked 1957, of course, and I just happened to pick the last Wednesday of 1957. Uh, and I picked Wednesday simply because uh, that was the day that all the coupons were going out. But when I do do this and I pick September 25th, 1957, I'm expecting to see the story of the flu on the front page of the paper. I'm expecting to see about hospitals overrun and people dying. But when I actually go to that newspaper, other things were going on in the United States on September 25th, 1957. The so, as um, you can see from the newspaper, this is the day that the desegregation of Little Rock, Arkansas high schools began. And it is really important to understand that not one the word flu, not one time was mentioned, no reference to the Asian flu, which had already begun to kill thousands of people, was in the September 25th newspaper in Knoxville, Tennessee. So I decided to, so I said, this is obviously so many things were going on back in the 50s. So I decided to go back and search all of 1957 using the word flu. And one of the first references I found was July the 3rd. And again, everybody should do this for your own paper because perspective to what's going on today is helpful in the way in which we're approaching the complete closing down of the American and world economies. But on July the 3rd, on page 5, a Wednesday, there's a small side note under the World Today section of the Knoxville paper. And it's, I mean, it's just a little bit of a note. It just simply says the National Institutes of Health said six American firms have developed an experimental vaccine to combat Asiatic flu. The vaccine has been sent to various laboratories to, uh, throughout the country for testing. Well, the way in which it would began to be tested is exactly because Dr. Hilleman decided to bypass all of those regulations, as I said. So this article this little blurb in July is the proof that Hilleman was doing. Hilleman was doing exactly what he needed to do. But then what happens in August is um, you wind up having, again, we're on page 12, the flu's moving forward. And so this is like almost unbelievable when you read this particular article. Can the flu virus kill you? Because this is all questions and answers about the flu. Um, it hits the very young and the very old. Most any virus can kill you, but this one doesn't seem like much of a killer. When deaths do occur, they are generally due to other complications. What can I do to reduce my chance of getting the flu? Eat well. Get plenty of sleep. Practice good hygiene. Stay out of crowds. Avoid people who, with colds. That's interesting that that's in quotes. 
If you are sick, stay home. At least, to, what's the danger going to be to Knoxville? Well, at least 10% of Knoxville will get the flu. And about two-tenths of 1% will die. Just a straight-out statement in the paper. And about two-tenths of 1% will die. But the bigger danger is to the community overall. It isn't to the individual. Unless he's very old, very young, or very sickly. The bigger danger is to the community because if 10 to 20 percent of the people are sick at the same time, essential services will be crippled and work in mills and offices can be seriously disrupted. So in this article on page 12, August the 27th, they know the flu is coming. It's part of conversation. And they're talking about that two-tenths of one percent are going to die if they get the flu. But the real problem is essential services will be crippled and work in mills and offices will be seriously disrupted. So this is August the 29th. And again, the, the, on, the, on the left is the um, full newspaper page. So you can see that there were a lot of other things going on. Jimmy Hoffa is alive, by the way. Uh, and he's on the, and he was on the front page of just about every single paper. And certainly he was uh, on page two of every paper uh, talking about uh, the issues with the AFL CIO and, and all the related issues that were involved. But this talks about uh, the fact that uh, schools should not be closed because of the pending flu epidemic. It specifically says school attendance and other public gatherings should not be curtailed because they will have little effect on the spread of the virus. Infants should get two shots. Uncomplicated cases of flu should not be placed in hospitals. So if you're, there's no reason to avoid going to crowds. It's not going to change the scope of the virus that much. If you're young, get two shots. And if you're just feeling sick, you don't get to go to the hospital. So the follow-up on the 29th of September. Mass flu shots called senseless. And again, this is a page A4 paper. Uh, and it talks about, this is a um, in San Francisco, a panel of medical experts had been um, um, gathered to discuss the Asian flu uh, epidemic because they figured that Ch San Francisco was going to be the first place that would have come into America. And the group met last uh, the, the night before this article was printed to talk about one of the, the things that they thought needed to be done. And one of the doctors on the panel had this comment supported by other doctors, but one primarily was quoted as saying probably only 20%. Now, does this sound familiar? Probably only 20% of the population will be hit. This means that 80 out of 100 will not get Asian flu. The experts also suggested that many of the cases listed as Asian flu were no more than standard winter respiratory ailments. All, panel, all the panel agreed that those persons were almost certainly killed by complicating the diseases. The people who had already died uh, had other underlying health conditions. The doctors did say, however, that there is always the real danger that the Asian virus may change into a more dangerous, deadly type of virus. But the consensus was, don't worry about getting vaccinated. You probably are better off without it. If you get the flu, go to bed and treat the symptoms. Don't worry about getting vaccinated. If you get the flu, go to bed and treat the symptoms. Again, it's not on the front page of the paper. It's the only mention is this one in this paper on the 29th, this Sunday. It's only mentioned in this one article. And on the same page as you can notice, oh, by the way, you can travel everywhere you want to go from Knoxville, Tennessee by rail car. And since there wasn't any guide, the, the guidance was that there's no reason to not be in a crowd, that you should, that you could travel from Knoxville by train uh, at three o'clock in the afternoon. You can go south all the way to Flor all the way to Miami. If you, and you can go, uh, if you leave in the morning, you can go north all the way to New York in the comfort of the Pullman car 
with all those other people. Ah, forgot this one. Uh, on October the 20th, again, a Sunday paper, uh, just a little bitty article over on the uh, left-hand side of the paper. You can, uh, and I mean, it's just still a small side note. Flu deaths rate up sharply. Public health reports overall death rate up over 10% for the week ending October 12th. Deaths from influenza and pneumonia up 48%. Overall death rate up 10% in a week. Death from flu and pneumonia up 48%. The flu shot production is running ahead of schedule. 60 million shots are planned for January the 15th, should be ready by December the 1st. And you got to remember, again, Dr. Hilleman uh, was uh, prescient in being able to say that the flu was going to hit. He got everybody started. He got everybody motivated. He broke all kinds of regulations to get a vaccine started. And then what happened was, as they got the flu moving, the flu vaccine moving, it just, the flu never made the papers. Again, just a little bitty article. And then on December 22nd, 1957, which coincidentally is my seventh birthday, the, there's an article on section B2. It doesn't even make the front page of the second section. Can you imagine? Stronger flu vaccine replacing early type. And what happened was the flu vaccine that they originally issued was just too damn weak. And what's more important, they knew it was too weak. They knew that it didn't have enough of uh, what are what uh, the measuring units, CCA units, uh, to be a real stop to the virus. So the article starts off, don't bank too much on that shot of Asian flu vaccine you got before December the 1st. It was so weak, it could not be relied on to give adequate protection. So the Public Health Commission advised the government to license the weaker 200-unit vaccine in the hope of heading off a bad flu outbreak. So the Public Health Commission knew it wasn't strong enough, but they wanted people to get something because they believe it added up to an important degree of protection, even though a particular individual couldn't rely on its effectiveness. The commission did note that the results were somewhat less than optimal. And the article goes on to talk about that you could go ahead and get a second shot, but really and truly you're going to need 500 unit vaccine shots, and a 500 unit vaccine shot wouldn't be available until the end of January. So they began giving out vaccine to people in uh, August and September that those people thought they were going to be immune and they weren't. And they wind up, I'm sure, as in today, being carriers who got in, reinfected or who became infected and made other people sick. So if we go now into March, the bulk of the flu is over. The bulk of the problem is behind us. And it now makes uh, page 17. It doesn't even make towards the front of the first section. The, uh, it talks about where the Asian flu came from, the research that had been done, and that the, uh, they were able to track it back so that they'd have a better vaccine in the future. And it goes on to talk about a special vaccine aimed only against the Asian flu virus is now in plentiful supply. Its potency was doubled in December when it was found that the original Asia flu shots weren't working too well. Now, think about that in today's world. They find out that the government purported uh, a vaccine that was going to make people immune to the flu, knowingly put out a flu virus, a flu vaccination that, they, that was too weak to do the job, and then they come back and say, well, everybody needs to go get a second or third shot. So in September the, uh, of 1958, it's a little article. Everybody's getting ready for big sales. Shopping's going on. Look, look at all the, in case you haven't been noticing, all the newspaper ads 
that are on every in every page on every paper. The economy in this country was still moving and moving st strongly, but I'll get into that in just a moment. It's because in uh, September they're pointing out that the flu is going to be back. The Asian strain of flu is expected to make another appearance this year, but experts predict it will be local in contrast to last year's nationwide epidemic. I'm not sure how the experts would have been able to say it's going to be local because they're still saying you can be in a crowd and it won't be a problem. Plenty of vaccine is now on hand. The 57 flu affected an estimated 80 million persons. Now, while not all of these were diagnosed as flu victims, each of these people suffered some respiratory ailment between July the 1st and December the 1st, 1957. So in the fourth quarter of 1957, 45% of the population of the United States was sick at one time. Early vaccine shots for doctors, nurses, hospital staffs, the aged, the chronically ill and pregnant women, and persons living where flu could spread rapidly, such as institutions, will be the first people to get shots this year. And that really gets to be important because in 1957, when Dr. Hilleman started the shots, the Army was the first group of people to get shots. And then it was the doctors and the frontline healthcare providers. And since, again, crowded places weren't much of an issue, they really didn't give many shots until into January of 58 for the people in crowded institutions. Think about what was going on in Seattle in February in that nursing home when the first of the COVID-19 patients began to die. And the, the way that this virus has spread, it must have been exactly the same. It would have had to have been exactly the same in 1957, except much worse. So fast forward all the way to September 1958, a year after uh, the flu really took full force in the uh, United States. So we're going into the following year. And flu on the increase in the Knoxville area made page 16 of the Thursday paper. And one of the doctors that was uh, being interviewed for the article talks about the fact that uh, everybody ought to go see their physicians and get a flu shot. But another doctor that was interviewed had a different advice. He said medical opinion varies as to whether people should get a flu shot. The local health department, however, agreed with the national authorities on predictions that flu will not be as severe and widespread this year as last. So again, a year before, on September the 25th, the stories were about the desegregation of Little Rock schools and not one word about the flu. But now, for some reason, the local health officials are saying that it's not going to be as bad as the year before. And you know the hospitals must have been overrun. The doctor's clinics and offices must have been absolutely overrun. So what happens next, if we just begin to look at this, and this is uh, from the website Population Pyramid, and you can look at any period of time to see how the population changes. And so in 1957, 177 million, I call it 178 million, and uh, in 2020, 331 million. And what's really interesting when you look at this graph is that first in the 20 to 24 year old age group, 3.1% of the population in 57 was 20 to 24 and 3.4% of the population, male and female uh, in 2020. The percentages of 20, 24 year olds hasn't changed, but look at the way the population pyramid actually works and how narrow that group of people were in that period of time. But what's really striking is the number of people who are 80 years of age and older, because almost no one in 1957 was over the age of 80. So if you even go on to 1963, the Hong Kong flu, and this is uh, May the 1st, 1863, after the great rush of the Hong Kong flu, 
And again, this is so six years after the end of the Asian flu, the Hong Kong flu comes through and kills 40,000 people. It could be between 40 and 50,000 people. And it's the worst killer flu since 57, 58. And again, the healthcare uh, providers, so the excess deaths for the entire nation as a result of the flu will run between 40 and 50,000 people. And it's far higher than the health experts figured when the epidemic was still in its infancy because that, then they felt the deaths might go slightly over 24,000 excess deaths over a normal year. They only missed it by half. And it's page seven. There's no panic in the country. The economy is blowing and going, trying to recover. And so in June, the summer of, 50, of 63, don't let the flu spread. <laughs> and so the question gets to be, are there any precautionary measures we can take to avoid the entire family for, to, for the entire family, not from getting sick? Isolate the person who's sick. Keep him in his room and don't let others visit him. Does that sound like the same exact news we're getting every day? The same exact news, the, the way the newspaper was reading in 1957? Exactly the same. Wash your hands frequently and always immediately after leaving a person who is sick. It probably does little good to wash your hands 15 or 20 minutes later. Everyone should get ample rest. Avoid fatigue. A rested person has better resistance against invading germs. It's amazing. We have known that social distancing works for over 600 years, since the plague. And every year, every time there is a pandemic, the same advice is given. The only real difference this time is that the world expects medicine to solve every problem. The people have just completely turned everything over to medicine and social media and the fear with which it has gripped the nation is unbelievable. So this is what I don't understand about what's going on in the media. Dr. Fauci the other day came out and talked about the fact that there could be realistically 100,000 or more deaths, maybe 200,000 deaths in this country. So if you just, anybody can do this, get on, you can go to your own and please get online, get your library card, read your newspapers and see what was going on. It'll give you a more comforting fact that you'll be able to overlive this problem. That 80, the same advice they said in 1957, 80% of the pro people in this country will have zero problems. 20% are going to get sick, but the death rate is going to be 0.15.2%. So your chances of recovery are extremely high. So again, let's just take a quick look at the math. 57, 178 million people. 2020, let's call it 332 million. 57, 25 to 45% of the population. 44.5 to 80 million people were infected. But because of extreme social distancing and what we've done to close down the economy, probably only 15 or 20% of our population will get infected. So the difference is in 57, only 13% of the population was over 60 and barely 700,000 people were over 85 years of age. Today, 22% of the population is over 60 and there are 6.6 .6 million people over the age of 85. So it's good to talk about social distancing and it, and for sure, people need to wash their hands, keep their hands out of their face. Don't be around other people for more than three or four or five minutes. And certainly no closer than four or five feet. But the reality is there's going to be somewhere between 43 and 104,000 people 
is the range of death that I believe is going to occur in this country. And I, be, and I do believe if the media would just simply say there are going to be people that die and there's nothing we can do about it. And the f absolute fear factor of, of the ability to not put all of the weight of solving every problem on every doctor and every person in every hospital. It's what medicine should. Medicine is here to help people, but it can't solve all problems. And it's unrealistic for us as a population to think that it will. We have to be responsible for ourselves. We have, just as they said in 1957, in 1918, in the great Spanish flu epidemic, practice good hygiene, stay away from people who are sick, wash frequently, eat well, get plenty of rest. I hope that this has been somewhat helpful. There's a great um, video uh, posted by a, a doctor in New York talking about, it's about an hour long, talking about what needs to be uh, done to help make sure that you won't get the flu, but also why this particular flu virus is a wimp compared to others. So I want to end on this last thing, which deals with the economy. And this is where we really are. If you look in 57, 58, there was a real recession that came on in the fourth quarter of 1957. If you look at the, just, and you can easy to do the research, history of recessions in the United States, 1957. The recession in the fourth quarter uh, caused the gross domestic product to fall 4.1%. And then it plummeted another 10% in 19, in the first quarter of 58. And so uh, the recession of 57, the country slipped into a recession that would increase unemployment by 7% and reduce corporate profits by 25% by April of 58. And one of the reasons President Eisenhower was able to get the interstate system through Congress was that he needed a public works program that could be expanded or contracted to help control the economy. Not one word is mentioned in any article about the fact that the Asian flu had killed 70,000 people in the fourth quarter of 57 and the first quarter of 58. Not, not one word about why there was a recession because 45% of the entire population was sick at the same time. But if that hadn't happened and we hadn't needed to get the economy up and moving again, no one will ever know whether the, inter the bill that created the interstate system as we have it today would have ever passed Congress. We don't know what the $2 trillion or $3 trillion stimulus package is going to do. But we know for sure there are going to be unintended winners and unintended losers from the stimulus package and the efforts that people are making to fight the coronavirus. And I'll be talking about those winners and losers tomorrow. Thank you very much.